Oh, Ben. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. Always a joy and a privilege to be able to bring a message from the Word of God to God's people. So the new year, the new year has come. All those resolutions. How you doing, brethren? Most don't make it through breakfast on the first, right? Hopefully you're doing pretty well. But New Year's, just the word new is just a wonderful word. You put the word new in front of almost anything and it sounds better. Because I have a car, but if I had a new car, wouldn't that be great? I've got a house to live in, but if you had a new house to live in, and I mean, almost anything. There's a, there's a new flu variant. You're like, what? well, I guess it doesn't really work there. But For a second, you were excited about it, right? New. It's just a, a marvelous word. And, and the new year, it's, it's all about the putting off of the old, leaving that behind, and, and beginning something new. Those of you who are old enough, do you remember the old cartoons where you had Father Time? meeting with baby new year remember little baby new year and it, it's about rebirth and, and again that newness and the great part about that is that's a lot of Christianity too about putting off the old and putting on the new in the Greek New Testament there are two main words that are translated as new the first is neos or neos and it's neo, where we get that word from. And it, it typically means new with regards to in time. New in time. New and improved product from such and such. But the more important word that we're going to focus more on this morning is the Greek word kainos. Kainos means new, but it doesn't mean necessarily just new in time. It means new in kind and in nature and in degree. Think, if you would, for a minute of a butterfly, right? It starts off as a little worm, and then it becomes a butterfly. Now, that butterfly is naos. It is new in time. In the past, it was a caterpillar, but now it's a butterfly. But more importantly, it's new with regards to kainos, because it used to be a worm, and now it's a worm, but with pretty wings, right? So there's been a change in its nature and its kind. That's what I want to talk about this morning with regards to what it means to be a Christian. That we are to be new, in kind, in nature, not just in time. I want to talk about the blessing that that is, but I also want to emphasize the challenge that it is. Because we are called to be a new creation. We are called to have new criteria in our lives. And brethren, here's what I want to offer you as a blessing this morning. Sometimes we forget the new contentment Christians are to have. Let's begin by talking about the new creation that Christians are to be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 12 through 17, I'm going to read this here, only have through 15 here. The Apostle Paul wrote, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, we talked this morning in our Bible class, there's only one way to get into Christ, and that's baptism. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, 
all things have become new. Now, that last verse we can take, and it's an overarching statement of what Christianity is all about. But in its context, its immediate context, it's talking about with regards to our humor and interactions. Notice how Paul started that statement. He said, we do not commend ourselves again to you. Paul had founded the church in Corinth. And he's basically saying to them, every time I talk to you, do I really have to introduce myself and say, hi, my name is Paul, I'm from Tarsus, I build tents. And I, you know, I'm no longer just the guy, Paul, who showed up. I'm the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ who came to you who gave you the gospel message, who laid hands, I'm sure, on many, bestowing the miraculous gifts they were fighting over in 1 Corinthians. You should consider me as Christians as not just that guy. And I shouldn't have to commend myself over to you every single time. You should remember me. And then he talks about Jesus. He says, there were those who knew Christ according to the flesh. You understand, Jesus grew up, right? You understand Jesus had a family. And we read in John chapter 7 and verse 5 that when Jesus began his ministry, his brothers did not believe in him as the Christ, the Son of God. You remember they were saying, hey, there's a festival of the Jews. Well, Jesus, you think you're all that. Why don't you go up to the festival? Announce yourself. And it says, because his brothers didn't believe. Well, one of his brothers was the man James. Well, what happened over time? Well, in Acts chapter 15, we find James as one of the elders at the Jerusalem church. He seems to be somebody pretty important in the church of his brother, Christ. And when you read the letter James, which we believe he wrote, you get the sense that James no longer considered Jesus just his brother. He understood that Jesus wasn't just a man. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. And that's what Paul was writing here, that even though some knew Christ according to the flesh, but we don't consider him that way anymore. He's not the carpenter from Nazareth. He's the Son of God, our Lord and Christ. That's the immediate context of that passage, but it applies so well to the greater context of our rebirth in Christ, that we are made a new creation. That's why we spent the time this morning, you may not have known that, in our Bible class talking about John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Jesus came to Nicodemus, well, other way around, and Jesus said, unless you are born again, interesting fact that again word literally means from above, and there's a, a significance to being born from above, which he goes on to talk about. He says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus probably, sadly, plays the fool and says, you know, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus got no time for that foolishness. He just simply says it again. I'm telling you, unless you're born again, you have no part of the kingdom. And then he talks about being born of flesh and being born of spirit. And everybody's born in the flesh, uh, but born in the spirit. He says, it's kind of like the wind and the leaves. You know, you can't see the wind, but you see the leaves move around and you understand that there's wind out there. So too with those who were born of the Spirit. I can see everybody who's born in the flesh, but those who have been born in the Spirit, they will look different. And I can see it or ought to be able to see it as well. We as Christians are reborn, born from above. No longer just the products of our genetics and the environment we were raised in. Now, children of God, understanding what He has told us in His revealed Word about who we actually are, that we're not just these tents and bags of bones. We are actually immortal spirits that are going to be able to choose in these tents where we spend our everlasting life, either with God, which we call heaven, or not with God, which we don't. That's the reality we understand. And now we are children of God. And if He is our parent, then we strive to share His nature. And if He is our parent, we strive to please Him and do only those things which please Him, as our Lord did. Romans 6, 3 through 13. Actually, that's the thing we studied this morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> Jim got it. Um, 
that new birth, that transformation, it, it took place, it began at our baptism. Because we were baptized and basically we were crucified, put to death. That's where we encountered the blood of Christ. That's where we were buried into his death so that we could access that blood and the cleansing of our sins. That's where we were circumcised with the circumcision not made by hands. That's where we died to sin. That's where we died and we don't have to worry about spiritual death. All that occurred when we were born again as a new creation. You remember when we talked about that passage, the biggest word when talking about that is right here. Notice the therefore. If. If we are born in Christ. If you were, and many times in the Bible, when it says if, you could substitute the word since. Since we were reborn. Since we are now in Christ. New creations. How ought we to be? Brethren, we need to understand that what God desires through Christ is not simply people who are better than they used to be. Not simply people who are better than much of the world. God wants a new creation, and the standard is Christ, right? Those who conform their images to the image of Christ are the ones who were predestined to be saved. So that new creation, did you become a new creation? Is there that, as Paul often says in Ephesians and Colossians, is there that clear line of demarcation between the old man and the new man? Are you living your life constantly trying to put off that new man, or put off the old man and to put on the new man? That's the challenge. And that's the blessing. To be able to have all those things in the past that, as he says in Romans uh, chapter 6, all those things that brought us nothing but shame, now forgiven and forgotten. A clean slate. Is that what you are? A new creation. Well, part of being a new creation is having that new criteria that you use with regards to life and your understanding. You see this common pattern in the New Testament of getting right with God first and then getting right with everyone else around you. Even the Ten Commandments start with what? The first Ten Commandments are all about your relationship with God and then the final six are all about our relationship with one another. The last one may be the most uh, difficult one because it's about the relationship with ourselves. Do not covet. But in Ephesians chapter 5, Verses 1 through 21, what's it all about? Okay, you are now the children of God. Live that way. You're now a new creation. Act new. Remember, kainos. New in kind, new in nature. Not just new in time. Father is God. You should act like Him. You should strive, as Peter said, to be holy as He is holy. So what does he go on to say? And, and so you shouldn't, as a new creation, you shouldn't be engaging in the darkness of the world. Instead, you should be serving as light to expose that darkness. And you need to come away from them and not be caught up into that darkness. Instead of filling yourself with wine, and what he's saying is, instead of filling yourself with the lusts and pleasures of the body, you should be filling yourself with the Spirit. And the best way to do that is to be singing to one to another, the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, loving one another. That relationship with God, when we get that right, notice what immediately follows. Verse 22, all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9. That new creation in God, from God, changes all of our relationships in the world. What's he talk about first thing next? Wives, this is how you should be with your husbands. Husbands, this is how you should be with your wives. Why? Because you're a new creation. You're not just a man who's married now. Now you're a Christian man who's married. And that's different. And it changes that relationship. What follows in chapter 6? Parents and children. It's no longer just mommy and daddy and the kids. Now it's Christian mommy and daddy with Christian kids. And it changes that relationship. 
And then it goes on to talk about even employers and employees. Are you an employer that, that, that helps keep people employed and helps them supply things for their families? Well, hallelujah. Now you're a Christian one. It changes the relationship. Do you work for someone? Yes. Oh, yeah, I got to work for old so-and-so. Wait, 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 wait. As a Christian, you should work for him as if you're working for Christ. Why? Because you are. Remember the relationships. That's the new creation's criteria at looking at all things. Brethren, if you never hear anything but this from me, we don't do Christian things. We are Christians. Therefore, everything we do is Christian. Okay? We aren't just ourselves as we were before God and we tried to do more Christian things. We are a new creation. And everything we do ought to be that new. It doesn't just change our relationships because it changes everything. It changes our worldview, the way we think inside of our, hell, our heads. It changes the whys and the whats and the wheres. Why are we here? What are we supposed to do while we're here? Where do we go when we die? All those questions have been answered in Christ so that now we know. Why am I here? To choose. Where will I spend my eternity? What am I supposed to do while I'm here? Well, it depends what I want. If I want to go to heaven, I need to strive to be Christ-like in all things, which means I have to study my Bible to figure out what was Christ like. And then I need to imitate him. Remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, imitate me. Why, because Paul's full of himself? No, because he was imitating Christ. We're supposed to be imitating him. And the where? We know the where. And the where we will go when we die is what motivates us and strengthens us as we're about the what we're supposed to be doing while we're here. Oh, I'm just so tired of this world. I'm just so tired of the filth and the corruption and the betrayal and the, the downward spiral. And then we look ahead and we remember glory. We remember fellowship with our Lord. With all those, that great cloud of witnesses that have gone before, we get to be together forever in heaven with Him. And what's it exactly going to be like? I can't tell you. All I know is we want to be there. And that will get us through. As always, Christ is the ultimate one for us to see what does that look like. I'm a new creature. Okay. Do you understand Jesus was a new creature? He was God. And yet he came in the flesh. That was new in time and new in nature, wasn't it? He humbled himself, emptied himself. And he showed us what it means to be a new creation and he showed us what that criteria looked like. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, anything that impedes our progress to heaven, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, brethren, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And he follows that up with what? You have not resisted the bloodshed. And then he starts talking about the chastisement of the Lord and all the struggles we're going to go through. Jesus is what that new creation ought to look like for us. Why did Jesus come and do all the things that he did for the joy set before him? Don't you think Jesus could have thought of better things to do than to constantly be walking, to not have a place to lay his head, to constantly be serving other people? No. There was nothing better for him to do because he wanted to go home to heaven. But what about us? Brethren, there's nothing better to do than to go home to heaven. And as a new creation with that new mindset, that's what we should be focused on all the time. 
on your own time. Read Colossians 3, 1 through 4, over and over and over to yourself. Memorize it. If we have been raised with Christ, where should be our eyes? Up where Christ is. Notice, Jesus was running a race too. You ever run a race? Only thing I don't like about races is there's a lot of running involved in them. Did you notice that? The point is, it's a struggle. It doesn't really come naturally to us to deny self and take up an instrument of torturous death to serve God and to serve others with all that we are. But for the joy set before us, consider him, that last paragraph, consider him, that means focus your mind on him and all that he bore. Because you know what? When you strive to do the good of God, you know what you will receive? Persecution and tribulation. You're trying to do good and people are going to attack you. And there's nothing worse. It hurts so badly. But consider him. And don't forget, follow me. How many times did Jesus say that? Follow me. Yeah, Jesus, I want to follow you, but where's the express lane? I'm not liking the road you walked. People were mean to you. They beat you. They spit at you. They called you names. They whipped you to death. And then they nailed you to a hunk of wood. Uh, is there another way? Well, we may not have to follow all of those things. But there is no other way. You've got to have that criteria in your mind. What you want. Because that's where you'll go. And here's the blessing, brother. Knowing. Knowing is the blessing. I am convinced that most of the terror of death is because of not knowing. What's going to happen? What is it? What's it about? As Christians, as a new creation in Christ, with the new mindset given to us, the mind of Christ, we have a contentment that the world cannot understand. 1 Timothy 6.6 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain, even if you have nothing to eat and nowhere to sleep. Because you have God, you have contentment. How? Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 27? He said to his disciples, peace I leave with you. Qualifier now, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus said, you, my followers, I give you my peace. But understand, this isn't freedom from struggle, persecution. I'm giving you a different kind of peace. Because when you read John 14, 27, you've got to balance it with Matthew 10, 34 and following, when he said what? If you think I came to bring peace, you are mistaken. I came to bring a sword to divide families, to cause husband against wife, children against parents. The enemies of your life could be the people in your very house. They're going to take you before judges. You're going to be arrested and mistreated. My peace I give to you, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. We have to put that together and understand. The peace that I have is not the life that I'm living. The peace that I have is the knowledge that no matter what I face, I can overcome. What did he say in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13? The things we face are common to man. It's nothing new. No one can say, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody can say that. Somebody's seen that trouble. But, Here's those two beautiful words. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure, but with the temptation will provide a means of escape. So every situation I find myself in, God, who cannot lie, who is faithful, has told me, if you face it, I will make sure you can handle it. We will never face a situation we can't handle. The means of escape sometimes, brethren, is death. And that's okay. What are you talking about, Rick? I don't want to die. You don't? 
Did you want to go to heaven or not? Well, yeah, I want to go to heaven. You, you can't go to heaven without dying. Dying is separating spirit from body. And we will either die physically and, and go to Hades and wait there until our Lord comes, or our Lord will come and our body will be instantly done away with and changed. That's a form of death. And, and then we'll be with Him forever. But there's no way to get there without death. So we have a contentment. No one can take from you the gift of God. The gift of God is God says, you decide where you want to be. You give your heart to whom you want, either to me as your God, as your creator, or wherever you want to give it. I give you that freedom. And no one can take that away from you. But he put a gun to my head, Lord, and he told me that if I didn't deny you, he was going to shoot you. And what would be the result of the shooting, my son? Well, I'd, I'd go and be with you. Right. What did Paul say about that? What did he write to you about that? Well, he said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For it would be better to be dead and with Christ. Do you believe that? There's your contentment. If you believe it. Brethren, please believe it. It's true. Again, we're not throwing our lives away. Life is precious. We have such joys here under the sun, but nothing in comparison what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 6, 7, or 8. Uh, it could be not. Who knows? I'm telling you it's in Romans. I'll just pull Paul. Is it not written that the struggles, the persecutions of this life do not compare to the glory reserved for us? Believe. Be content. Be filled with that joy. Listen to Paul. Philippians 4, 4 through 6, or 6 through 9. Be anxious for nothing. That's a hard one. He's not saying don't be concerned about things. He's not saying don't spend the time working things out. He's not even saying don't be worried at times. We've got a lot of folks with sick family members in here. Poor little Owen was sick, those of you who have had kids. Remember what it's like to have a sick baby? There's nothing more pathetic than that. So there's things to be, you know, on your mind. But he says don't be anxious about it. Another way of saying that is trust me. Trust me. I've told you, yeah, I, Rick, tell you, always remember that the worst thing that can ever be done to us is we get sent to paradise. The worst thing that can be done to us is we get sent to paradise. That's true, brethren. I'm not lying. I'm not playing games. That's the truth. So if that's the worst case scenario, I can struggle not to be anxious because the worst thing that can happen is I get sent to paradise. Instead of being anxious and always worrying about stuff, I should in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, like the John 14, 27, the peace of Jesus, which surpasses all understanding, the world will never understand. Christians singing as they're being murdered by the tens of thousands in Rome, they could not understand it. That peace will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, don't focus on those things. Focus on these things. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate, focus your mind regularly on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And what's the result? The peace of the God of peace will be with you. If you focus on the negative, shockingly, you will be negative. You got that idiot box in your house, constantly telling you how the world's going to the capital of Montana in a handbasket? It's not. You can unplug it. You can focus on what's good. I'm not saying put your head in the sand like an ostrich. No, ostrich theology here. I'm just saying, what we need to focus on is the good things. The result 
is peace and contentment. Well, all these things, they're attacking Christianity. The church is, is struggling. The church is growing smaller. Eh, debatable, but maybe pure. Um, all these things are going on. What are we going to do? Well, I'm going to focus on the good that's going on. Is God still God? Amen. Is Jesus still Jesus? Amen. Salvation is still full and free? Amen. Is the gift of God still mine to partake of? Amen. Worst that can happen is a word called paradise. Finally, remember this. This is what he told us the end would be if we focused ourselves. He said, brethren, join in following my example, just like in 1 Corinthians 11. Note those who so walk, meaning we have lots of examples to follow. We can look around and see Christians that are in it to win it, and if we follow their example, we will be in it to win it, and we'll have that joy and contentment. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind, who walk according to, on earthly things. For our citizenship, church, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. That's better than paradise. That's when our Lord comes and we have that spiritual body and we are joined with all the saints who have gone before and we all go together to the Father. Focus on that no matter what you're facing. And you can have contentment. Here's the challenge. We're called to be a new creation with new criteria in life. And we ought to partake of that contentment that God offers us. The question is, will we do that? Ephesians 4.13, we're to strive to that standard, the measure of Christ, the perfect man. That's the goal we're striving for. Agonizomai, agonizing to achieve. That's the new creature. We're tr struggling to transform like that worm to become that butterfly if you will. Is that what your life is? Is that who you are? Or are you like that Pharisee in Luke 18, 9 through 14, who was just happy and content to be better seemingly than someone else? God doesn't want a better person. God wants Christ-like. God doesn't want just a new and improved of you, new in time, neos. God wants a new creation in you. His work, His creation unto everlasting life. There's your challenge. Brethren, if you accept it, there's your blessing. If you're not a Christian this morning, God calls to you with the blood of His Son to wash you of all your sins and all your troubles and all your stripes. He will give you all you need to know. All the reassurance and comfort you need are found right here. He has already given it. For you. The question is, will you partake of it? Why not this morning? Christians, don't lose sight. I know the world is hard. I stub my toe too. I get irritated too. I struggle with the same things you struggle with. But as long as we stay cross-eyed, focusing on our Lord, meditating on what He's told us, so that we don't simply believe, but we believe we will have a contentment in this life that will draw people to us and that will see us to that day. If you haven't been doing that, turn back. If there's anything we can do to help you,